for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and you're watching my lecture on Brave New World, the novel by Aldous Huxley, and I'll be talking a little bit about some of the historical and intellectual contexts for the novel. So, uh, again, we're talking about Brave New World. This novel was published in 1932, and as I said, I'm going to be talking about the intellectual and historical context. That's not this list. So one of the first and most obvious and important contexts for understanding a novel is to understand who Henry Ford was and to understand uh, the philosophy of Fordism. So, uh, and this is important because in Brave New World, Ford is the uh, almost the god of their society. The entire society is based around Henry Ford's philosophy and in particular his business philosophy. So Henry Ford was a business magnate, a very important business leader in American history and world history. He was the founder, of course, of the Ford Motor Company, which produced its first Model T, the first uh, consumer automobile in 1908, an important date for Brave New World. And the key invention that Ford uh, gives to us is the assembly line. So the assembly line is the key to mass manufacturing. That is manufacturing of goods on a massive worldwide scale. And that's one of the things that makes uh, it such an important invention. Without the assembly line, we do not have our modern industrial economy. The assembly line is also important because it allows for a division of labor, whereas before you would have one person who had to make all the parts for a particular consumer good, one craftsman. Now you can have a number of different people all working on small individual tasks, each working on one part, each working on tightening one screw, etc. So you can have much more uh, a division of labor across a number of different workers to produce the same object in less amount of time and also with less expertise. The laborers don't have to be um, as skilled in their knowledge. And a third result, a third outcome of the assembly line is what uh, the philosopher Karl Marx called alienation. That is the sense of the workers' detachment from their job. So while the assembly line did allow people, did allow more people to work, um, and it allowed for a greater uh, employment and again manufacturing of consumer goods on a hitherto unforeseen scale, it also alienated the laborers from their work in that they don't feel they have ownership over their work. The work could be very boring, monotonous, um, and thus uh, very draining emotionally for the workers who didn't feel attached to what they were doing and lost a sense of ownership and personal pride. So it caused certain social problems, even though it had this economic benefit. Now, what is Fordism? Well, it's a philosophy associated with Ford, and its focus is on economic expansion and technical technological process. That's what Fordism is essentially all about. And it has a few key features. One of the keys to Ford's um, economic philosophy and his philosophy on society was standardization. Uh, replacing individually produced items that have all the quirks and flaws of an ind individually produced good with massive uh, mass manufacturing of identical consumer goods, things that share the same properties that are all identical and allowing mass consumption of those goods. This was key to his idea for both economic stability and social stability, that everyone should be able to purchase the same set of goods, the same car, the same microwave well microwaves didn't exist obviously but the same whatever everyone can purchase them and that's enabled through the manufacturing uh through assembly lines also important for fordism was a focus on consumerism right to go with this massive manufacturing and standardization is the consumption of these products and so ford for his time raised wages a great deal the idea that workers should be paid living wages, they need to be part of the consumption cycle, they need to be paid enough so that they can purchase at least some of the goods that they're manufacturing. Um, and again, this is part of uh, not just, you know, this isn't just humanitarian on his part, this is in order to 
expand the economy in order to have more people contributing the economy, essentially controlling uh, more and more of resources involved in the trade and production of goods. Because Ford believed that consumerism was the key to the future, was the key to prosperity and progress. If all of the uh, uh, needs of the human individual could be supplied by products that they could purchase, then there would no longer be a need for war. And he believed that this, this uh, philosophy of mass manufacturing would be the key to that. Now, as I said, Henry Ford believed that his model for a society based on a kind of uniformity of consumption, where everyone is working on an assembly line, earning wages to then purchase the products produced by that assembly line, he believed that this would be the key to stability in, uh, uh, in our time, the key to ending all war. Um, he was very quickly, uh, of course, disappointed with the eruption of World War I which is variously called the Great War and was called the War to End All Wars. Um, this broke out in 1914, ended in 1918, and it was a traumatic event for a number of reasons. World War I is really what we might call the first modern war, and as such, it brought to light the kind of horrors and the massive destruction that the new technologies of war could inflict that we could inflict upon ourselves. And in many ways, World War I is where we see the assembly line theory brought to warfare, where one soldier dies and another one is brought into his place and it's just sort of an assembly line, weapons manufactured on a massive basis, um, and uh, uh, just a, a general horror uh, at the death and destruction that the new technologies could bring. And this was very traumatic for the world, very traumatic for people in Europe, because it seemed to go against a lot of the ideas of progress that they had put their faith in. So post-World War II, you have a number of important historical developments. Um, the first, you've probably all heard of the Roaring Twenties, right? The Twenties were a great time of celebration and fun, largely as a reaction to the horrors of World War I and the traditional values, the values of traditional society that World War I seemed to show as false or hollow, these ideas of of um, human dignity and nobility and progress and so forth. So the 20s were in some sense a rejection of that. They were a, an attempt to um, loosen up society in some, in some ways. Many people found this troubling, of course, with the new sexual liberation, uh, especially among women, um, was found to be uh, very, very disturbing by, by the more conservative elements of society. But we see that this is, again, as I said, a rejection or a reaction to the horrors of the war that they'd just been through. So after the 20s, we have the Great Depression, uh, which again is a traumatic event because it seems to shake people's faith in the economic and political structures that were supposed to guarantee them peace and prosperity. The Great Depression was another failure of the new economic prosperity, the ideals championed by people like Ford. Um, and many people, as of course you know, suffered greatly, uh, starved, died, uh, struggled to, to, to make ends meet during this period. So just like the 20s was a rejection of the traditional values that had brought us to war, the Great Depression was uh, not exactly a rejection, but a, a shaking of the faith in the new economic prosperity. And perhaps the most significant and deadly development going on post-World War I is the new rise of totalitarianism, uh, which influences Huxley in his novel a great deal. So we'll talk about that.
So what is totalitarianism? Um, it's also sometimes called authoritarianism. Basically, to be to very simply define it, a totalitarian government or totalitarian political philosophy is where the state recognizes absolutely no limits on its authority. The state can do whatever it wants. Um, and the state has the power, or at least attempts to have the power, to regulate all aspects of public and private life. So it's really um, anathema to, that is, it's the opposite. It's such a, it's a contradictory philosophy to our own ideals of democracy, where the state is limited in what it can do, where the individual has rights that are guaranteed that the state, we're told, cannot infringe upon. And fascism is the name that we give to probably the most famous uh, type of totalitarian authoritarian government. And fascism is characterized by uh, particularly an extreme nationalism and uh, that, that I would say not just borders on, but becomes a full-fledged racism. So for example, the uh, anti-Semitism that we see arising in Nazi Germany, that's that extreme nationalism. The German people are being attacked by this evil um, other race, right? That's that's how the Jews were portrayed. That's the kind of extreme nationalism that defines fascism. And the word fascism comes from the word fasces, which is, means a bundle of sticks, a bundle of sticks that's tied together. So the ideology behind fascism is that the individual is nothing. The individual can be broken, but when tied together, the individuals become a strong unit. So again, the state is all, the individual is just a component of the state and has no real rights or power. Um, the state has all the authority. So where does fascism get started? Well, our first major fascist leader that we have in Europe is Benito Mussolini, who becomes prime minister in 1922 uh, after a coup, um, an uprising. And he becomes, he really establishes a lot of the philosophy of fascism and is, becomes very influential throughout Europe, including influencing the person that we'll see in a moment, Adolf Hitler. And here he is, our uh, dear enemy, Adolf Hitler. In Nazi Germany, he enters politics right after World War I and takes advantage of the disillusionment and the suffering of many of the German people after the, um, uh, the peace of World War I caused so many economic and social problems. Germany was punished very inten intensely by the victors of World War I. So Adolf took advantage of that sort of discontent. And in 1933, which is the year after Huxley's novel is published, um, the Nazi party becomes the only legal party in Germany. And in 1934, two years after Huxley's novel is published, Hitler becomes ruler for life. He uh, essentially eliminates all possible mechanisms to remove him from his position at the head of the party. So this is our, and Hitler, of course, is the person we define most uh, closely with fascism. And alongside Italy and Germany, there are, of course, other fascist movements going on in Spain, for example, uh, but perhaps one of the most interesting and complicated stories of another rise of totalitarianism is the rise of totalitarian communism um, in the Soviet Union. So this really begins with the Russian Revolution in 1917, where the czarist regime, the monarchy that had ruled uh, uh, Russia for many centuries, is overthrown. This is a, they're a horribly oppressive re regime, and so they're overthrown. But there's a civil war that quickly follows between the factions, the victorious factions, the whites and the reds, with the reds winning and establishing the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union essentially based on a modification of certain Marxist ideals. It's We don't have enough time to go into all of it, unfortunately, and it's not my area of expertise. But basically, one of the major things that, um, that we see in the Soviet modification is through the figure of Vladimir Lenin, who's the first major leader. And we see him uh, envisioning his party as the vanguard, the communist vanguard that will lead the struggling masses to freedom. 
uh, which is something of a modification of Marx's idea that that the Marxist revolution had to start with the workers themselves, not with some vanguard class, but with the workers themselves. And Lenin also modifies Marx's ideals by restricting the revolution to one country. Marx's ideal is of a worldwide workers' revolution. Um, and so in many ways, the modifications that we see are what leads to, in my opinion, what leads to the rise of totalitarianism in communist Russia. In 1924, Lenin dies and Joseph Stalin begins to rise in authority. He eventually becomes the dominant figure for a couple decades in Russia, and he rules largely through a very strong authoritarian grasp and through his cult of personality. And in Stalin, we really see the, the um, importance of loyalty to the party and the state. So it, what many people might call a betrayal of some of the essential ideals of Marxism which ultimately was, was looking for a, uh, a stateless state. Um, the ideal of communism, as Marx saw it, was that the state would wither away. There would be no more government. Um, but with totalitarian communism, we see the establishment of the party, of the state, as the ultimate authority. And so it parallels in some ways, although with important differences, the rise of fascism in Italy and Germany. So let's just review what we've talked about in this first half. Considering the historical context that we've discussed so far, what are some common themes that you see? Uh, what patterns do you see in these developments? What are some of the common, um, what might be common causes or results? Think about how you might connect the political, excuse me, the political developments to Henry Ford and his philosophy. And what do they have in common as well as what are the differences between Henry Ford's philosophy and the philosophies of fascism and totalitarianism. And think about how they contribute to the background of the world of Brave New World. That is, in what way can we see Huxley responding to these ideas or drawing on these trends as he creates his vision of this dystopian future? Think about that and let's take a short break. So let's move to some slightly different um, context, some intellectual context for understanding the novel. And we'll begin with the figure of Sigmund Freud, who many of you might have heard of. Hopefully you've heard of him. He's mentioned briefly in Brave New World as an alternate name for Henry Ford. In their future, they've, uh, they think that Freud and Ford were the same person because of however the documents that they've lost, and their his the loss of history and the time between now and then. But of course, they were different people. And Freud is commonly known as the father of psychoanalysis. Um, and his key innovation, for our purposes at least, is the unconscious. So what is the unconscious? It's not just, doesn't just mean being asleep. It's actually far more radical than the way we normally use this term. Um, when he talks about the unconscious, he is positing that our conscious mind, that is what we are aware of, when we're awake, what you're thinking, um, is only a very small part of our total mental activity. And then in fact, there are always unconscious thoughts, desires, drives, other things going on in our minds that we're not aware of consciously. Um, so it's not something, it's, it's not uh, a lack of consciousness in the sense of a lack of activity. It's actually the unconscious is a very active, potent, um, part of the psyche that we are not aware of that affects our behavior every day. And how is the unconscious formed? Well, he says it's formed primarily through repression of desires, and in particular, the desires and impulses that we that are unacceptable to our conscious mind or to our conscious, uh, to our social world desires, sexual desires, violent desires, things that we're not allowed to express or that we're not supposed to feel, um, that we have pushed down or that have been forcibly pushed down by others in our mind. 
and these impulses escape. They try to find expression through various ways in dreams, in slips of the tongue, um, and in various symptoms of mental and physical distress. Now, ideally, what happens, according to Freud, is that the unfit desires that are deemed socially unacceptable, for example, humans are violent, humans have desires sometimes to hurt other people, um, destroy things, that's an unfit desire, it's, it can harm others, it's socially unacceptable, it doesn't contribute to society. So that's channeled into something more appropriate, like sports, martial arts, where that aggression can be um, released without danger. Or maybe it's maybe even more abstractly, it's, it's focused into one's ambition, one's desire for success. So rather than trying to hurt others, um, you try to build yourself up. So that's an example of unfit energies or desires being sublimated. But sometimes if repression is too strong, the inappropriate desires, rather than being supplement, sublimated and redirected, they find themselves erupting in other ways in our life. And that's how they cause mental and physical symptoms of distress, um, which in Freud's time was often called hysteria. So let me give you an example of how this works um, and how Freud thinks this works. You've probably heard about, or hopefully you've heard about, the Oedipus Complex. This is one of the most important and controversial theories in Freud's work. The Oedipus Complex is really the primary event of repression in a lot of ways. It's where the um, unconscious, in a certain sense, gets established in Freud's view. And it's so it's the basis of our unconscious, the difference between our unconscious and our conscious mind. It's also the basis for our proper socialization. The Oedipus Complex is where our unfit desires are first redirected into something that is socially acceptable, socially valuable. And at the same time, it's a root of all of our social tensions. It's the root of our, the problems that we experience in our life. Um, and just as a last little throwaway note, it's named for a famous character in Greek myth, Oedipus, who accidentally kills his father and marries his mother. And we'll see why that story um, was appealing to Freud when we look at how the Oedipus complex works in a sort of simplified version. So let's begin. The Oedipus complex, according to Freud, is something that happens in very early childhood, in infancy almost. And it begins with the child's fantasy. And he's talking here implicitly about a male child. Um, the male child's fantasy is that the male child and the mother are one. The mother is the male child's, or any child's, first object of desire because the mother provides love, affection, food, cleaning, all that sort of thing. And so the child's fantasy is that they are one with this mother, and the father is really nowhere in the scene. What happens, of course, is that the father intervenes. The father says no. This is a sort of symbolic no. Um, the father says no, tells the child they can't do something. And symbolically, what Freud is saying is that the father separates the male child from the mother. The father says, no, the mother is mine. You cannot have her. There is a rivalry between the male child and the father. But ultimately, in the successful Oedipal complex, the male child is expelled from this union with the father, with the mother. And so what we get instead is what we'll see on the next slide. And so the family structure is established with the father and mother above the child. And actually, even though I presented this as the father and mother on equal status, really what happens is the father is established as the patriarch, the mother as a secondary authority, but also as property of the father, and the male child is at the bottom of the hierarchy, properly subordinated in authority to the father. Now, this is important. This is important, as you can see, not just um, because of the authority in the family structure, but this serves as the model for the uh, subservience to or the recognition of all forms of authority. The father is the first authority figure, the first one that tells you, no, this is what you have to do, and so becomes the stand-in for all future authority figures.
And then, ideally, again, the family structure is reproduced. The male child becomes a man and seeks out a woman and attempts to become himself the father. A new, if he couldn't have his own mother, he finds a new woman who replaces her, becomes the new mother. So he takes the place of his father in a new triangle, in a new structure. So the authority is reproduced. The child is given an identity to seek out. The child is placed in a socially acceptable arrangement and the system can reproduce itself. Now, so what's important about this complex? Why is this important? Well, through the Oedipus complex, it's what how the child learns what it's appropriate to want. What are the appropriate objects of desire? The mother is not an appropriate object of desire because she is the possession of the father. And this extends to other things. No, don't stick your finger in that outlet. No, don't eat that Tide Pod, whatever it might be. Right? The child learns what is appropriate to want by following the authority of the father. The father says, no, you can't have this. Instead, you can have that. The desire is also directed outside of the family unit. It's very interesting that this seems to be a social component of the incest prohibition, just as incest has certain biological um, uh, disadvantages, we might say. Um, there's also a social reinforcement to the incest prohibition, directing the child's desire outside of the family away to another woman, an object outside of that family unit. The Oedipus complex also establishes the authority of the father. The father is the one that determines what it is appropriate to want, what the child can and can't have. The father is the one that owns the mother. The father is the one that says no. And so the authority of the father is established and thus the model for all authority figures is established. The identity of the child is also established, and identity is established as a form of imitation, right? What is it that the son can do? What is it the male child can do if he can't have his mother? Well, he can be his own father or be a new father, be a new type of father and find a replacement. So one doesn't take the place of the father, one imitates it and sets up your own little hierarchy, your own little patriarchy. And that's how you fulfill your identity. But at the same time, it establishes, and this is what's grim about the Oedipus complex and grim in some sense about Freud's ultimate um, view of humanity, is there's a certain impossibility of achieving fulfillment. Because on the one hand, we're always subordinated to that idealized father. The father who's the father, you know, the father that, that you had when you were a little baby, who could do anything, who was all powerful. That imaginary idealized father image is always still somewhere there in the back of your mind and you can never quite live up to it. You can never conquer that father. And on the other hand, you can't have what you really want. Your first object of desire as an infant is the mother, but you'll never get to have that. You always have to have your desire fulfilled by some replacement object. Well, you can't have that mother so you find a different woman and that becomes the object of your desire but it's always a stand-in so there's a certain grimness to this um, view and of course there's the fact that it's based on an inherent conflict that there's always a conflict between the father and son even once the son has successfully navigated this complex and been socialized there's still uh, the sense of a nagging underlying rivalry between father and son, again, because the son can never truly fulfill his desire, truly fulfill his identity. And now, uh, many of you might be asking, well, what about women? What does this complex have to do with women? One of the strengths and the weaknesses of it, ironically, is that it doesn't have a lot to say about women, that is about women children. Um, Freud was not able to really make the Oedipus complex work for women, he did posit an alternate version where the woman, instead of becoming 
the uh, a father, the woman, her option, the girl child's option is to become the object of desire herself. So she has to become the mother. Now, I think uh, I say this is a weakness of Freud's theory because, again, he um, was looking at things from a male centric perspective. He was not really considering females experiences and he did not theorize them or study them as much. At the same time, it's a strength in that he shows that in a patriarchal society, patri patriarchal society in which the father's authority is the defining role, uh, the defining voice of authority, there aren't a lot of places for women. Women don't have a lot of clear cut roles laid out for them. They are always an adjunct to or a supplement to men. Um, so it's the strength, ironically, in that he shows one of the weaknesses of patriarchy is that it, uh, uh, one of the problems of patriarchy is that women don't have a place. Okay, so now let's take a break. I'd like to end by talking about the um, last couple of intellectual contexts that are important for uh, understanding Huxley's novel. So first, briefly, just to talk a little bit about eugenics, um, which was a uh, name given to a set of beliefs and policies wherein one tries to improve the genetic quality of a population. So it's about population control through practices such as selective breeding, sterilization, um, contraception, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a means of, of population control, uh, both in terms of the number of people and uh, the quality, so-called genetic quality of that population. And it's based in a flawed philosophy of genetic determinism. That is the idea that your character is due solely to your biology, that your genetics, uh, for example, uh, determine whether or not you're going to be a criminal, determine your level of intelligence, determine your level of success in society, et cetera, et cetera. And it um, ignores the role of education and social situation. And eugenics in the United States um, is largely been based in race science, um, science that's uh, racially based, um, junk science that doesn't look at the natural world and then attempt to study it, but rather begins from certain racist assumptions about the differences between um, humans and then attempts to create a scientific justification for those existing racist beliefs and existing racial hierarchies. So that's the core fault at, of eugenics. Now eugenics, because of its racist and um, very cruel uh, practices, we associate it with places like Nazi Germany um, and the, the eradication, the attempted genocide of the Jewish population. But um, eugenics was very popular in the United States and United States eugenics experiments were quite influential on Nazi Germany, actually. Um, it's just a, a few highlights or lowlights rather. 1907 was when the first mandatory sterilization law was passed in the United States, in the state of Indiana, that allowed for mandatory sterilization of certain undesirables, people who were deemed mentally unfit or criminal. Um, and in 1927, after some various challenges, um, the Supreme Court ruled eugenic sterilization constitutional. It had already been going on, but it was officially ruled constitutional in 1927. Um, and, it, and it continued to become very popular uh, in the 30s and 40s, um, and it continued even through the 70s and 80s. But after World War II, after Nazi Germany, it became much less popular in the U.S., obviously, as you might examine. And in 1981, um, Oregon, which was one of the last states to have a forcible sterilization law on the books, 1981 was when Oregon performed their last forcible sterilization. So in a certain sense, it's over in the United States. However, it still happens in certain um, situations. For example, in 2000, from 2006 to 2010, it came out that uh, 148 female prisoners in California were sterilized without their consent. So this is something that still happens in the United States although it is, of course, rare.
And to give you some statistics, in the 20th century, um, and this is primarily post-1927, post the Supreme Court decision, there were approximately 62,000 forcible sterilizations in the United States, 62,000 people, 60% of which or more were women, uh, were forcibly sterilized, sterilized against their will. Primarily, this was on poor women, uh, people who were undereducated, oftentimes people who were mentally challenged. Um, minorities were frequently targeted. Both African-American and Native American women were um, often uh, sterilized. There were certain groups that ex explicitly targeted minorities as an attempt to weed out, again, quote unquote, undesirables or to slow the growth rate of, quote unquote, undesirable minorities. And um, these people, uh, the women and men who were sterilized, they were often misinformed. Oftentimes they didn't know that they were being sterilized. Sometimes they were threatened that they would be, go to jail, they would lose benefits, they would lose welfare unless they submitted to the sterilization procedure. So it's really a very dark, um, dark chapter in our history. And it's one that's, as I said, not a very old chapter and one that's still open. Okay, and let's talk about one last context for understanding Huxley's novel, and that's behaviorism, um, which was another school of psychology that held that all behavior was a result of our reflex, was a result of conditioning. And in many ways, this is a rival method to Freud and other schools of thought. It Rather than where Freud is trying to find a much deeper um, psychic origin for our behaviors and thoughts, behaviorism is making it much more superficial saying it's reflex, it's conditioning, it's not a matter of depth. So this is a rival method in many ways. Now, the main thrust of behaviorism, much of the, the classical work of behaviorism, doesn't get published until after Huxley's novel is, is written, but the basis for behaviorist thinking has already been established and clearly is something that influenced Huxley. Um, and that's the experiment uh, for which Ivan Pavlov won the Nobel Prize in 1904. You've probably heard of it, the classical experiment with dogs where he would ring a bell every time he fed the dogs. And so they associated the stimulus of the bell ringing with the food. And thus eventually they were made to salivate just at the sound of the ringing bell, even without the presence of food. And B.F. Skinner continued these sorts of experiments, and he did a lot of experiments with positive reinforcement. So the idea, this, this contrary idea to Freud's that um, while behavior might be very deeply rooted, at the same time, behavior could be controlled through stimulus and reinforcement, again, something that we see in the novel, um, is already an idea that's been established um, by the time Huxley's writing. So let's do a second brief review before we end this uh, presentation. Considering these second, the second set of intellectual contexts that we've discussed so far, Freud, eugenics, behaviorism, um, what are some common themes or patterns that you find in these developments, in these ideas? And can you connect them to what we've talked about before? How do these ideas maybe relate to what we've seen in talking about Ford, um, the rise of totalitarianism, etc.? Can we see any connections between Freud's theories and Ford's theories? And again, bringing them all together, how do they contribute to the background of the world of, of Brave New World? How is Huxley drawing from all of these different contexts to create the story, the novel that we see here? So just a couple of final questions for you to think about. What problems and issues in his world, in his time, seem most important to Huxley based on the novel? What seem to be the things that he thinks are most, um, are most pressing issues, are most pressing challenges in the world? And what does he think, seem to think are the biggest dangers that we face? And how does the society of Brave New World try to solve the problems of the modern world? How do they deal with issues of population and instability and violence? How do they attempt to do that through these different uh, ideas that we've seen in this lecture? And what aspects of these contexts do you see in Huxley's novel?
That is, how does the world of Brave New World build itself from the ideals of Fordism, totalitarianism, fascism, eugenics, Freudian psychology, behavioral psychology? In what ways do all those different elements go into creating Huxley's world? So those are just some starting questions for you to think about. If you have other questions, of course, you can contact me via email, text, etc., etc. With that, I will see you in my next video, and I wish you the day you wish yourselves.